Good afternoon. Welcome and thank you for joining us for this term's second virtual retro seminar. My name is Rita Mota and I'm the Intesa San Paolo Research Fellow at the Oxford University Center for Corporate Reputation. With me today is Alan Morrison, Professor of Law and Finance here at the Said Business School in Oxford, who co-convenes these seminars with me and our guest speaker, Judith Schremk sterling Judith is Associate Professor of Responsible Management at the Geneva School of Economics and Management, where she is also Director of the Executive MBA Program and Co-Director of the MSc in Responsible Management. Judith is an expert on business and human rights, corporate social responsibility and responsible consumption. And she's recently authored important work on corporations responsibility along their value chain. As a former member of the Global Citizenship Department at Hewlett Packard, she brings both practical and intellectual expertise to her work. We are extremely lucky to have her with us today. And I'll turn the floor over to Judith in a moment. But before we start, I'd like to say a few quick words about the seminar. Retro, that is Reputation, Ethics, Trust and Relationships at Oxford, is a seminar series that is concerned with the ethical and normative content of trust and reputation in organizational life. The series is generously supported by the Center for Corporate Reputation, which is an interdisciplinary research center here at the Said Business School in Oxford, directed by Rupert Younger. I can see that many of you have already joined us for previous retro seminars, and so you know how we got here. But for those of you joining us for the first time, Here's a quick overview. Retro used to be an Oxford-based seminar series, and we decided to move it online because of the coronavirus pandemic. Despite the challenges that naturally come with such a change, we've been delighted to see that the virtual seminars generate conversations that are as intellectually stimulating as the ones we had in person. Not only that, but we quickly discovered that we now had an opportunity to involve people from all over the world in these events. And so, as in previous retro seminars, today we have an incredibly diverse audience with us again, spending more time zones than I can easily count. Bringing retro online has only been possible because of excellent teamwork, and so I'd like to thank a few people for their precious contribution to this series. I want to thank Rupert Younger, Director of the CCR, and also Sarah Livingston, Chris Page, and Mark Hughes Morgan, who have worked tirelessly behind the scenes. And I am particularly grateful to Alan, whose experience, expertise, and wisdom have been absolutely crucial to the existence and success of this seminar series. Today's seminar addresses a matter of fundamental importance that directly speaks to our center's mission. Judith is going to talk about business and human trafficking, with a focus on structural injustices, social connection, and corporate political responsibility. Human trafficking is, of course, one of the most appalling yet lucrative international criminal activities, and it is much more pervasive in global supply chains than many would like to admit. As Judith and her colleagues point out, any business involved with modern slavery and human trafficking faces significant reproach from the public and therefore risks substantial reputational damage. More importantly, Judith will demonstrate that business involvement with human trafficking contributes to the perpetuation of structural injustices. As the world struggles to cope with the coronavirus pandemic, this topic becomes even more important. NGOs, civil society, and international organizations have all sought, sounded the alarm as to the increased risk that vulnerable people everywhere are facing. On the one hand, <clears throat> victims of human trafficking are mostly left with limited or non-existent access to healthcare. They live in conditions that increase the risk of infection and they may not even access COVID-19 testing because of a lack of information or fear of deportation. On the other hand, the economic effects of lockdowns and restrictions, rising unemployment and even travel bans inevitably increase the number of people worldwide who are the most vulnerable to exploitation. And so the pathway that Judith is going to present today is not just morally desirable, but also practically indispensable, and above all, one that requires urgent attention. Judith will speak for around 30 minutes, during which time she will respond to clarification questions only. After that, we will have some time for questions and answers. 
please enter your questions and comments into the Q&A box and either Alan or I will relay them to Judith. You can find the Q&A button either at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on the device that you are using. And we're going to finish promptly at 5 p.m. Judith, thank you so much for being here today. The floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. <clears throat> Let me share my screen. And you shout out if you cannot see it. So I take silence as a passive approval or passive yes. All right. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. First of all, um, thank you, Rita. Thank you, Alan. And thank you um, to the Center for Corporate Reputation to have me here uh, today virtually. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very delighted to be with you, um, at least virtually in the Zoom world. Um, as Rita was already um, alluding to, um, I'm talking about human trafficking and the role and responsibility of business. And I have been working on, on this topic for already several years, and I would like to give credit to two of my uh, co-authors with whom I've been working on this um, for quite some time, Michelle Westerman Behalo and Harry van Buren. I know Harry is there um, in this webinar and maybe Michelle as well. So if you are, um, hi and thank you. <laughs> so let me give you a one minute elevator pitch of the whole talk. So if you have to leave early, then you have at least the domain pitch, although Rita did already a very good job at that as well. So in our work, what we are proposing um, in our work is a holistic approach to corporate responsibility for human trafficking. So we position human trafficking as a structural injustice, and I will talk more about it, what it exactly is. Um, our approach highlights the social connection of business um, to human trafficking, and from this connection derives what we call a political responsibility of business to eradicate um, human trafficking in the global supply chains. Um, more specifically, our social connection and political responsibility model is based on Iris Marion Young's um, analysis on structural injustice and social connections. So those of you um, in academia who are working on this or in philosophy, you might be familiar with Iris, um, Iris Marion Young's work. Um, what we do in our work is we differentiate between business with a strong connection to human trafficking and businesses with a weak connection to human trafficking, and then also the likelihood of businesses being able to collectively join with others to do something about human trafficking. And as a result, from this you know, strong weak connection or the ability to do something collectively, we discuss different corporate responses to human trafficking and we show that the genuine ethical commitment to eradicate human trafficking in global value chains is possible and how that is possible. But let's start, let's take one step at a time and start with a couple of, uh, of the definitions. So what is um, human trafficking? Um, broadly speaking, human trafficking describes the recruitment or refers to the recruitment transportation of persons by use of force, fraud or coercion to then obtain from those people some type of labor, basically labor exploitation, forced labor um, or forced marriage um, for that effect. And um, it goes without saying, and Rita mentioned it as well, human trafficking is one of the most tragic human rights issues of our time. If you just think about this idea that a human being is treated as a pure input into the production process, a pure commodity that's just traded, used, exploited, um, it's just uh, um, extremely yeah, tragic and, and hor horrifying and horrible. Unfortunately, um, human trafficking is big business and basically in two senses. First of all, human trafficking is a business in and of itself. Um, here are some numbers to refer to. So the yearly profits that are made from human trafficking um, are $150 billion a year. Um, human trafficking involves over 40 million people um, that are victims of human trafficking. And as a side note, the numbers, because human trafficking is also most often hidden, getting the exact numbers is quite, uh, quite difficult. So these are estimates from the ILO and other institutions. Um, and then one in four of those human trafficking victims are children. Um, so it is big business. Um, besides, human trafficking can occur in all kinds of sectors and industries. Of course, some are more prone to it in terms of, you know, if you think about seasonal work, um, like in agriculture and farming or construction, but honestly, human trafficking um, can be found anywhere in any type of, of industry and sector. So, <clears throat> 
what is done about human trafficking? Um, there are two main responses, and I don't want to spend too much time on regulation because the focus for today um, is on corporations and the corporate responses. But still, it's important to notice that, um, in the, especially in the last 10 years, we have seen the development of a couple of new regulations trying <coughs> to, um, to get a <clears throat> a grasp, pardon, uh, excuse me, um, to get a grasp on, on, on human trafficking. We have, for example, the UK Modern Slavery Act from 2015. Australia um, just a few years ago also introduced um, uh, a modern slavery bill. So all those regulations that we see slowly popping up basically require companies that meet certain conditions um, to publicly state what they are doing um, in terms of eradicating um, human trafficking. Um, however, those regulations do not specify how companies are supposed to do it, so how detailed their statement is. However, it forces them to publicly state what they are doing um, in terms of eradicating or addressing human trafficking in their supply chains. Um, from a corporate side, um, how corporations have responded to, um, to the rise, rising concerns of human trafficking, particularly in their supply chains, um, the response of corporations basically translates into what's referred to as corporate due diligence, which broadly speaking um, consists of a couple of steps or a couple of stages. First of all, corporations um, are <clears throat> expected um, to assess the risk of having human rights violations or particular human trafficking in their supply chains. So they do a risk assessment and how far their supply chains are more prone to human trafficking. Then accordingly, they adopt policies, which they might also have to do based on the regulation in their country. And then what most companies are doing is they engage in auditing and monitoring of their supply chain. So firms have been increasingly doing this. Um, they try to then through those audits and monitoring of their suppliers, try to identify human trafficking and also remind their suppliers of their particular policies in regards to um, human trafficking. However, <clears throat> Um, however, research and maybe some of my colleagues who are doing tremendous research on this um, have actually um, found that those uh, due diligence processes, particularly the ethical auditing of the suppliers, is not very um, effectful or the effects of rec or the results of those audits are rather sobering. Um, supply chain auditing is criticized for focusing too much on the first year suppliers. Um, however, human trafficking actually occurs way lower in the supply chain. So if you imagine you have the supply chain, there are only a few moments in those product supply chain where human trafficking enters. And if you audit before or after those entry points, you're simply missing the human trafficking. Um, so the existing auditing system is just simply criticized for not doing, you know, not auditing at the right, at the right spots. Um, besides, um, the auditing um, system or approaches by corporations are also criticized for focusing too much on ticking the box um, and thereby creating um, what some have coined cosmetic compliance. So they're basically just engaging in auditing for the sake of auditing just because they have to, it's expected and they check the box and they feel the responsibility is done. However, by just taking the box, it doesn't mean you solve the problem, especially again, if you look at the wrong part of your, of your supply chain. So, um, so overall, there are um, the current approach that corporations are taking is simply not cutting it, it's simply not um, successfully addressing human trafficking. And given this ex criticism, the existing scholarship in global value chains in human rights is increasingly calling for more holistic and incremental approach to human trafficking. And um, this is what my co-authors, Harry and Michelle, um, and I have been doing over the last couple of years by trying to figure out or thinking about what a holistic and incremental approach to human trafficking could look like. And we start our perspective on the issue of corporate responsibility for human trafficking by really thinking about why do we have human trafficking? And we phrase it more as a structural injustice. So, how do we end up having human trafficking? What are the structural conditions on the supply as well as the demand side that make human trafficking exist in the first place? Um, so from the supply side, we can think of many factors that contribute to why people are willing, almost unwilling to become victims of human trafficking, unknowingly, obviously. So there are numerous political, social, and economic factors that foster the supply of human trafficking. If you imagine, you know, 
victims of human trafficking, their original position is um, very desperate. They might come from areas of extreme poverty, um, of areas with extreme overpopulation, where there's simply no, no place for them, no options, no economic options, no, um, no, no other kind of options available. They might live in, in zones of conflict, in conflict zones or in, in war zones. And they're simply um, so vulnerable that they would do anything possible to get out of this desperate situation. And then if they um, hear somebody talking about, you know, oh, I know somebody who can get you somewhere, you can get you over the border here and there, and there you have a job. They just, you know, they just pick up any opportunity they can to do it and without knowing falling victim of human traffickers who take away their passports or charge them lots of money um, that they then have to repay in the poor jobs that they, you know, were not expecting, they were expected or promised something else. So this is the supply side. However, even though we have supply, the question is, of course, there has always to be demand for it as well. And the demand for human trafficking is um, linked in large part to practices of multinational corporations who want the cheapest production of their goods possible in a most efficient way. So in this respect, human trafficking is a foreseeable but yet unintended result of business practices. And I'll talk a little bit about intent um, a bit later. But com uh, companies are focusing so much on cost cutting and efficiency that they simply do not see how the human supply chain, you know, makes all of this possible. Um, so human trafficking as a result is the outcome of a large scale social structures that are created by and consist of multiple actors, including business. And I mean, I'm singling out business here now because that's the focus of my research, but it applies to lots of other actors who through their innocent decisions contribute to the structural conditions that make human trafficking possible. And that's why we think it's very helpful to think about human trafficking as a structural injustice. Um, so now I coined it the term of what is you know, structural injustice. So what is a structural injustice? Structural injustices exist when social processes put large categories of persons under a systematic threat of domination or deprivation of the means to develop and exercise their capacities at the same time as these processes enable others to dominate or have a wide range of opportunities for developing and exercising their capacities. This is um, a one-on-one -on -one definition from Iris Young of her 2006 work. So in other words, structural injustices exist because of the many individually taken decisions by many different actors that sort of maintain the status quo and maintain those structures and they create simply as a ripple effect create injustices that no one intends to it's not the causal relationship it's just simply the joint effect of all those different decisions if i'm a consumer and i want to buy a cheap product if i'm a business who just you know wants to produce a product extremely cheap and i put pressure on my suppliers and expect flexibility and expect um, um, you know, um, the lowest cost, then that all leads eventually to the demand for cheap labor. And, you know, actually companies have now successfully managed to almost put the cost of labor to zero, which, you know, equates human trafficking. So it can't get, get cheaper um, than that. And thinking of human trafficking also really in terms of structural injustices, that kind of are the result of independent innocent or unintended, you know, um, uh, consequences um, kind of shows that using a concept of responsibility based on blame is not really working um, in this regard to really address the problem of human trafficking. Instead, what we are proposing is to really think about analyzing why human trafficking exists or persists as a structural injustice, and then developing concrete responses for each party that is linked to it. So it's basically framing human trafficking as a structural injustice really reminds all of us to think, and then especially corporations, as that's the focus of the talk, um, for corporations to really think about how the ordinary day-to-day -day operations and decisions contribute to the maintenance of those structures that make human trafficking more, um, more likely to exist. So um, 
<clears throat> Let me say a few words why businesses, so I already said, you know, the talk is about corporate responsibility um, for human trafficking. So why do businesses have this ethical responsibility, or in our papers, we also call it a political responsibility to human trafficking? Um, it is fair to assume that businesses do not intend to be, you know, complicit in any way in human trafficking. Um, but intent does not really matter with regard to what businesses should do when it comes to human trafficking. If there is a potential for either, uh, if, if there is a potential either for avoiding complicity um, with human trafficking or for making a positive difference in alleviating it, we propose that businesses simply have this ethical obligation to do so. So it is also at the core of Iris Marin Tseng, um, 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 theory or model of responsibility, and I'll say a few more words uh, in a minute. Um, also, what's important when we think about why companies have a responsibility or particular ethical responsibility to um, eradicate human trafficking, and it's important to think about agency and choice and think about, yeah, yeah agency and choice of, of business. Um, because with agency comes responsibility. And it's, I think we can all agree that businesses can choose through various supply chain relationships and their management techniques, whether or not they're exposed to risks of human trafficking in their supply chain and further have the capacity to influence, at least in part, the behavior of their supply chain participants. But businesses, of course, they face competitive pressures, but still they make choices every day about the strategies and that, turn, that in turn has effects on whether they are exposed to more risks to have human trafficking in their supply chain or not. Just thinking about the contracts, the terms and conditions that businesses give their suppliers, the time pressure, the cost pressure, and, and all of that, that does create a higher risk for human trafficking in the supply chain. And it's this choice, from this choice, from this agency develops a responsibility to, um, to address it. Um, and finally, um, business may undertake actions designed to give them the appearance of distance um, from possible exposure to human trafficking. So say through outsourcing. So as I mentioned already, human trafficking oftentimes occurs way down in the supply chain, far away from the lead firm, far away from the Nestle's and, and, and all, of that, um, all of those companies um, um, at the top of the supply chain. However, the appearance of distance does not mean that businesses have actual distance from human trafficking. Um, and can therefore disclaim any responsibility if human trafficking occurs, because at the end of the day, it's a product and it's a business decisions that connects them to human trafficking, no matter what the actual or perceived distance is. So um, what does this holistic approach that you know I alluded to at the beginning of my talk, uh, um, what does this look like? Um, so a holistic approach to addressing human trafficking rests on the assumption that the parts of something um, are interlinked so that one cannot address one part without considering the whole, right? And so because it's all interconnected, it's a systemic, a systemic issue. So a holistic approach to human trafficking builds really on the connectedness of actors, components, and actions within global value chains. And again, I'm you know, focusing here on business, but it also involves you know, other actors. It involves governments, it involves us as consumers um, as well. So part of the social connection approach is then an obligation for businesses to understand how their contacts, their industry, their strategies, their business models, create the potential for a nexus to human trafficking. So firms have a responsibility to go deeper than adapting their existing practices. And firms must interrogate whether those practices themselves are proximate causes for human trafficking and then change those practices if this is the case. Um, let me go a bit more, more deeper. So um, those of you, Marita said it might be a slight diverse um, audience. So those of you who are more in academia, you know, when you write articles and do some work, you have to have a theoretical or academic contribution. So um, I have a, one slide on that as well, where we kind of move the, the conversation on, on Young's model a bit further from an academic point of view. So let me highlight maybe three components of our, our, our model here. So first of all, our social connection and political responsibility model calls upon firms to go beyond the expectation of due diligence, so what I start with at the beginning, and to take affirmative responsibility for the ways in which 
their business practices contribute potentially to human trafficking. So a social connection and political responsibility model takes responsibility not just for what a firm has done, but actually for what it has not done and what positive contribution it could make. So really rethinking its business model or really think about how its ordinary business day-to-day -day decisions contribute to the structural injustices of human trafficking. So if firms have not interrogated whether their business models make involvement in human trafficking more likely, they simply have not fully taken responsibility for preventing such involvement. More specifically, political responsibility means questioning you know, the status quo, questioning what's currently normal and, um, and acceptable. Um, the second point um, in our model is that our model address that our model is forward rather than backward looking. Um, rather than focusing on blame, and I mentioned this before, when you have a structural injustice like human trafficking, blame doesn't get you get you any, you know, very far. Um, so we encourage to look at the results. So really start focusing on the results, which is also linked to the third uh, bullet point and one's contribution to the results. So political responsibility emphasizes the future more than the past. And the goal of business actions in this domain should therefore be to contribute to the kinds of structural reforms that then ameliorate the likelihood of future harm or the likelihood of, of having um, human trafficking in the supply chain. So um, linking those two first two bullet points, it's our model or Political responsibility, again, is not about what you have done, but not, but it's about what you have not done in terms of, it's about, you have to think about what can you do to improve those situations and undo those um, uh, um, societal or structural injustices. Um, finally, um, our social connection and political responsibility model allows for greater openness with regards to what sorts of actions are consistent with assuming responsibility. So I mentioned already, we are drawing on Young's work. We are equally also drawing here on work from Godin, um, who differentiates between duties and responsibilities. So a duty refers to a rule to be followed. In the case of human trafficking, that you know, um, undertaking due diligence, for example, is you know, the duty. Um, and once the actions are associated with the rule have been performed, the duty has been discharged. And this is what companies are currently doing. They are engaging in the supply chain audits and their due diligence, and then they tick the box and the duty is, is done. However, the responsibility is not done unless human trafficking um, has, has disappeared or is at least on the verge of disappearing. So in other words, carrying out a responsibility consists in seeking to bring about a required outcome. So in this line of analysis, a firm could fulfill its duties. So, you know, as I already said, with um, um, engaging in due diligence, but fail to really discharge fully its responsibilities associated with human trafficking. So we therefore really want to reorientate the conversation about business and human trafficking to focus on the outcomes rather than the processes and on responsibilities rather than duties. And we currently see that companies rather focus on the process and then just kind of discharge their responsibility by saying, but you know, what else can we do? We just, you know, did the audit. So our hands are clean, but it's really about, we need to think about the outcome and the outcome is um, to have no human trafficking in your supply chain. So what would it look like if a firm follows this holistic approach, you know, the social connection, political responsibility model to address human trafficking? Um, as a result, we think if, if a company um, follows this, it kind of then really starts to engaging in a genuine ethical commitment to eradicate um, human trafficking. Um, so ethical commitment represents a stance <clears throat> taken by businesses in which they take responsibility for not only um, complying with the technical requirements, so the duties, but also to do so with acknowledgement of their contribution to conditions that make human trafficking likely throughout their supply chain. So the end result is that ethical commitment leads businesses to take responsibility for possible complicity in human trafficking, even if they had every preventative mechanism in place and in so doing, better discharge the ethical responsibility related to such structural injustices. So it's really kind of, you don't really care about the process or, you know, you just, you know, you do it because you genuinely want to do the right thing and, and, um, and address the structural injustice. Um, more concretely, 
<clears throat> uh, exercising ethical commitment means ensuring effective remedy for human trafficking that has occurred and preventing the future um, reoccurrence, obviously. And ethical commitment shifts the perspective from a focus, again, as I mentioned, from a focus on processes and the activity of due diligence to the ultimate impact outcome, which is eradicating human trafficking, and thus goes beyond minimal compliance to an external standard. Um, ethical commitment also strives for an integrity um, oriented approach in which businesses takes its commitments to abolishing human trafficking seriously and businesses with an ethical commitment stance take a proactive role, um, even if it means going beyond what is legally required. So going beyond also this taking the box and really thinking about what else can be done. And finally, ethical commitment shifts the perspective from denying responsibility to actually really taking responsibility. In practical terms, ethical commitment as a leadership oriented stance on human trafficking requires managers to think about the business models, to think about the practices and strategies just in a completely different, different way. Um, <clears throat> so what would it look like, let's say, in, in practice, um, really? So um, I will not stick into this, this metrics um, for the time being. Um, however, what we've done in our work is also looking into and in how far companies and whether companies are strongly or deep or, or weakly connected to human trafficking and then if they can work with others um, to address human trafficking and then we really thought about how can companies respond to um, addressing human trafficking and we kind of have you know I, I like metrics I know some something is wrong with me here but I like them um, so we had a, a two by two metrics um, so I'm not going into detail all, um, in all of them but um, I give you a snapshot of it so there are different types of possible responses that are consistent with ethical commitment um, one response might be that we think about a company really wants to take a general you know, genuine ethical commitment and one way you can kind of address human trafficking is try to control as much as you can. So a company might just decide to vertically integrate. So trying to, I mentioned it earlier, if you think about those entry points into the product supply chain where human trafficking comes in, if you control as a company those entry points, you might be in a better position to, um, to ensure that those entry points are close and you have no human trafficking. So one, of course, extreme um, way would be to actually engage in vertical integration. Um, besides, businesses could also ally with other businesses in their supply chain or with, um, within their industry or even across industries um, to kind of in a partnership approach um, address human trafficking or businesses can try to or, or seek ways to make their own employers or customers aware of human trafficking and, um, and raise flags when um, when, when they encounter it. So um, an example could be if you're a bank teller in, in a bank, um, you know, human traffickers, they need bank accounts. Um, so do victims of human trafficking that oftentimes have bank accounts. Um, so some banks, Abbey and Amro in the Netherlands, for example, is training its tellers at the front office to kind of pick up on cues if they might have um, either, you know, an account of a trafficker, but also maybe an account of uh, of a victim of human trafficking. So certain cues and they go through training and, and all of that. So a lot of different ways for companies can, can do. And also industries that you might not have at first on the radar that might be connected with, with human trafficking. So um, I know it's a kind of a serious, um, serious topic and I'm, I'm often told to, to end on a high note. So I would like to, um, to highlight uh, one company that we feel um, at least kind of resembles most our um, social connection and political responsibility um, approach to human trafficking. And um, this is Tony Shakalonis. I don't know if, if you heard about, about the company. It's a Dutch-based uh, chocolate company, and it is strongly committed to closing the entry points of human trafficking into its supply chain. Its journey started, I think, around 10 to 15 years ago with the owner being so uh, committed to saying, we it is, it must be possible to have slave free chocolate and he made it possible and he showed it to Nestle and the other big companies that still haven't, um, haven't done so successfully. So Tony Shakaloni is an, is an industry with a high risk of human trafficking and forced labor, um, especially at the, at the bottom of the supply chain, if you think about the harvesting of the chocolate beans. So the firm has a strong connection to um, human trafficking. And um, Tony Shakalonis um, uh, 
approach is to work very closely with its suppliers, but actually particularly with the farmer. So it goes really to the very bottom of the supply chain where it would be most likely to have um, human trafficking. And they take a strong partnership approach. They engage in long-term partnerships with their farmers and the co-ops. They provide them um, and they ask for traceable cocoa beans for the operations. Um, they work at least five years with, with their suppliers or even then longer. Tony Chacoloni's um, employees um, and staff go regularly to those farms to really kind of keep this relationship going, provide them also with training of, you know, how to, um, um, you know, harvest in, in a more sustainable way in general, but with a particular focus on on eradicating human trafficking. Um, so the personnel of Tony Ciacoloni, um, you know, engages with the cooperators, um, engages with the farmers, um, visits them regularly, and they really strive for this long-term partnership and really open and transparent uh, relationship between them. And as a result, Tony Ciacoloni reg reg regularly um, receives uh, the prices of being, you know, uh, slave-free chocolate and actually also very tasty chocolate, um, um, I, might, I might add. So um, Tony Ciacoloni really has evaluated every ingredient in its product line to ensure that it has eliminated all risks of human trafficking in its operations. And um, it really touts its ability to make slave-free chocolate and be commercially successful. Um, as a side note, you know, this is not a chocolate, you know, that you get in only like a rare luxury special store. You get it in the regular supermarkets in, in the Netherlands, like it's just a normal sized chocolate bar. Um, they also now started expanding a bit more globally. I think I even read that they made it to the UK, um, but some of you might, might know this better. It hasn't made it to Switzerland yet, um, but they are expanding um, more and more. So um, I think that's just a great example from, from what we looked at when we tried to find good examples, which you know is sometimes not so easy. Um, Tony, Tony Ciacoloni really kind of resembles what we would describe as genuine ethical commitment to eradicate um, human trafficking. And with this bright red slide that actually uh, resembles my, my bracelet, my, my necklace, um, I'll um, stop sharing my screen and thank you for listening. And I'm looking forward to your questions and, and discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Judith, for the excellent presentation and for making such a complex topic sound uh, much more accessible to everyone. <laughs> um, I would just like to remind all of our uh, participants to type their questions and comments into the Q&A box. Um, Alan will then relate your questions and comments to Judith. Um, we will try to go over as many questions as possible. Um, if we cannot reach yours, then we will make sure that Judith gets it anyway. Uh, so so you, you will still be heard. Um, so I'd like to start with um, a question about um, one of these forms of ethical commitment that you mentioned, um, vertical integration, because in, in the face of it, it, it sounds absolutely perfect, right? Because um, if, if a, a business controls everything that happens throughout the entire value chain, then chances are it will be able to, to eradicate the possibility of human trafficking. But in, in your paper, um, you point out the risk that this will just generate a displacement of the problem of human trafficking to other firms. And so the, the, the injustice will still uh, remain in, in that industry. And so I guess my question is, if I understood your approach correctly, if this displacement happens, then you will consider the firm that integrated vertically to have failed to discharge its responsibility. And so my question is, given that it might be completely impossible to predict whether that displacement will occur or not, how, how can a firm uh, decide what to do in a situation such as this one um, and, and you know, discharge the type of political responsibility that you've been advocating? No, that's a good question. And it actually reminds me of a situation we had at Eula Packard many years ago that um, uh, HP was very strong and also, you know, having a supplier code of conduct. And one, one point where HP was very um, adamant about was overtime. So they had a very strict clause and I think it was 50, so 50 hours in total, eight or so hours in total overtime per week. And they monitored the suppliers. And what happened was that people in those HP factories resigned, went next door to the factory, 
that did not have this um, requirement or this reduced overtime possibility because they needed the money. So it's really exactly this kind of displacement of, you know, you kind of HP could say at least my our hands are clean, um, but the problem persists. I think this is where where Young's model is is really helpful, but very hard to put in practice because if you let's say now vertically integrate. So if you take this route, you are on this up left box as a company, you vertically integrate and then um, human trafficking still kind of basically gets you know, displaced to, to your next company. This then really involves that you engage in collective ability. Um, so in our two by two metrics that um, you know, I briefly only showed you on the slide, the vertical integration actually really means you're kind of acting a bit alone, which is not really the sense that Young would advocate for because Young is very strong on this political responsibility and collective ability. Um, the way I think I see it and you know you never have time to write all of it in the paper is that the virtual integration might be a first step. But then as a next step, you really have to see what is the, the ripple effect of that, the unintended consequences, and what you know, how does now your decision to vertically integrate do to the structural injustices or conditions and then go from there. And I think ultimately, in order to address issues like yeah, human trafficking or any structural injustice, you need to work together as an industry or even cross industry. So I think then to your point, I think the matrix must also be understood as a complete like dynamic model that you start maybe with a vertical integration, but then you try to really work with others to see then how you then get rid of human trafficking wherever it then moved to. Thank you. Okay. Alan, do you want to ask your question next? <laughs> Yes, so just unmuting myself. Um, we have a few great questions from the audience coming in. So I'm going to combine the question I was planning to ask with one of those questions. Um, and it sort of leads on from what you said in your conclusion, uh, in your response to Rita's uh, question. Um, I guess the point about structural anything, and structural injustices in particular, is that they're structural. So um, it's very hard for an individual actor faced with a structural injustice to do very much about it. Mm -hmm. um, you have example, you know, apparently um, uh, Tony Chocolani successfully mm -hmm. does this, but um, if the structural injustice you face is that people will buy any item of clothing provided it's a couple of, a couple of dollars cheaper than another item of clothing and there are people who don't care, um, it seems hard for a single actor to cope with this. And I wonder, if that's true, is it necessary that we have multi-industry partnerships? And is it is there a role, is there a necessary role here for the state? So a sort of related question is coming from Robert McCorkdale in the, mm. the QA, who says, actually, in order to make this sort of thing work, do you need do you need legislation? Um, even if it's quite light legislation, is there some need to have a coordinating device that comes from a state actor? Um. Good, good question. Maybe take the, the regulation first, because I have a couple of other articles and opinion on, on the regulation. Yes, we do need the state. Um, I don't know, those of you who know about my background, I'm, you know, did my PhD with Guido Palazzo at HSC Lausanne, who is, you know, all, well, who, who supported political corporate social responsibility, kind of the retreat of the state. Um, I wrote a couple of years ago an article, you know, the state has to come back in. So, um, so to Robert's point, yes, we need, I think we definitely need regulation because, um, you know, history has shown us that companies don't kind of thrive for, you know, just out of blue air and goodwill to up to uh, and take responsibility for everything. I think the regulation has an important point to lift the floor for all companies a little bit. So kind of really create um, a movement that, you know, at least from the from the bottom, it, it lifts up. So regulation is needed. And we see we have regulation for modern slavery, human trafficking that, you know, does already its part. And we'll see, I think the, the, the UK Modern Slavery Act is about to be kind of a bit updated. So we also see what happens in the future. But yes, I think regulation you would need because again coming also to 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 young's model it is about collective ability um of of different actors and you need the the push and pull from different corners and also maybe as a consumer you need to be nudged sometimes from the companies that maybe tell you or remind you to maybe not buy necessarily you know the cheap product or the state um, so all actors have to play its part which is why it's so hard because you know we um, still have, uh, you know, the, you know, I find myself sometimes, you know, seeing, oh, this is 
a few bucks cheaper, maybe, you know, <laughs> I can't afford it this month, so maybe I buy the cheaper product. So, I mean, I find myself um, in that situation in a similar sense. Um, mm -hmm. Remind me, the first question was about, do we need MSIs necessarily? Was that it, Ellen, or what was? Um, well, it was, in general, the extent to which organizations can act alone. Um, so, yeah, okay. it might be that regulation is necessary to compel collective mm -hmm. action. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, we, we can find Tony's Chocoloni successfully doing something roughly on its own, but mm -hmm. in, a, in, the, in the apparel industry, it seems to me implausible that a single organization could accomplish anything. Yeah, and also, I mean, Tony Chocoloni is also, you know, a different beast than, let's say, the Nestle's, right? I mean, it's like, it's a smaller company. It can kind of try to handle it a bit better than, you know, others can do with, you know, some of them, you know, have thousands of suppliers, right? So that's also a scaling thing. If you're smaller, you are maybe more likely to control certain things. And then the industry plays um, plays a big role as well. Good point. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll, I'll pick up on another question that um, Robert McCorkadale had in his uh, message and then link it to another one that is popping up in here that okay. I find very interesting. So Robert is also interested in knowing um, how you can determine how effective a business has been in acting in accordance with its responsibility. And then there's another related question here from, um, forgive me if I pronounce your name wrong, but Alicia Shivji. Um, and Alicia is um, asking if you are concerned that um, a forward-looking model uh, that encourages corporations would, would encourage corporations to avoid designing and implementing effective remedial systems to uh, correct abuses such as human trafficking that have already occurred. Yes, I think you have to reform. You have to repeat that one. Yeah, sure. So are you worried that the fact that this approach is forward looking oh, would forward. actually mean that companies don't have the incentive to design and implement remedies for human trafficking problems that they've been involved mm. with in the past? Okay, okay, okay. All right. Um, let me let me take the let me take Roberts again first. Let me write this forward looking if that's a concern. Okay, all right. Um, the, um, how do we know that um, actions are effective? I mean, I could not give the very blunt and arrogant answer, like, because nobody finds human trafficking anymore. And then, you know, it is, right? If the NGOs, you know, no one sees it. But of course, um, yeah, that would be, you know, the arrogant answer. But I think part of it is true that, you know, if, if you don't see it anymore, but you are looking, Right, so that might be the, the, the you know, but you are looking because that's you know what we see often that firms might not really be looking. Um, so I think the the effective way would be you know that you that you really have an eagle eye on those entry points, um, and and if 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 you don't see it, and more importantly, if um, civil um, society organizations do not see it, then that might be one one at least indicator that, you know, it might have, um, you know, you might have solved the issue or reduced the likelihood of human trafficking for the time, time being. Um, now the second question about whether I'm, because it's forward looking, whether I'm worried that firms wouldn't do it. Um, I'm not because what you see, what also happens is firms are criticized for not doing something. So, and this, you know, not doing something is also because, you know, you are looking forward. Um, I'm not, I don't, I would like to, I don't know. Yeah, I, I hope I get a chance maybe to talk to Alicia a bit more why she thinks I should be worried about it. Cause I don't, I don't see why the forward looking would necessarily um, be, be a problem with that, but yeah. Well I obviously can't read Alicia's mind, but I'm guessing that uh, a firm could hypothetically, for instance, say, well, I'm expending all of these resources, all of this attention, all of this time, trying to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Um, then why, why should I spend an equal yeah. amount of time or effort or resources trying to fix something that's already happened when in reality, it's even it's it's actually debatable whether you can fix something as horrible as human right. trafficking. How do right. you actually remedy something like that? 
Yeah, no, okay. Yeah, I can see it. Or there's also be a resource problem there, but I think it comes down to, I mean, corporations like to, and I've worked for one as well. So um, companies always like to take, you know, the first step, like, oh, we can't, we can't do that when, when you know, it in, in the electronics industry, when the, when the problem of uh, conflict minerals came up, the first response from all companies was, you know, oh, we can't, you know, we can't do anything about it. We can't trace it. And now you have those um, traceability, uh, you know, those uh, um, different kind of, of, uh, mechanisms how they suddenly can trace it so I think and that's still for me partially you know is forward looking because the problem was it was not about particular that they of course they caused human rights violations then in the past but it was the demand was moving forward we don't want to have conflict minerals how can you make this happen so in that sense they are doing it but I think it's it's a bigger black box that I think needs time for companies to to figure out so the challenge is bigger but I don't think it's necessarily impossible, but it is, it's, it's less concrete because as you said, you know, you kind of can't, you have to figure out your own limits or the best approach to it. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to roll one of my questions up with two questions that have come from our audience. Um, I was concerned um, as I thought about structural injustices and the organizational responsibility to deal with them, that it, this, responsibility places a massive epistemic burden on, on firms, right? So um, <clears throat> for sure, you can trace the minerals that you're using in your supply chain. Mm. But if the problem is really structural and very macroscopic, it may be very hard for an organization to understand exactly what mm. structural problems cause injustices. And I wonder if that places some firms at a relative disadvantage in dealing with this. So I had originally thought that small firms would be at a disadvantage. Karen Cripp says, well, if Tony Chocolony can do it, why can't the big chocolate companies? Maybe it's the other way around. Maybe the big chocolate companies have a mass massive epistemic disadvantage. And a related question, at least I think it's a related question, is coming from Matt Caulfield, who says that one way you could deal with the risk of human trafficking is just to avoid dealing with certain parts of the world. So a U.S. company might hire largely in the U.S. It doesn't mm -hmm. eliminate the risk, but it mm -hmm. perhaps mitigates it. Mm -hmm. But um, that could have all sorts of deleterious macroeconomic effects for workers mm -hmm. in the areas you avoid. And mm -hmm. I think how big those problems are um, seems to me part of the epistemic problem. Matt's mm -hmm. specific question is whether this sort of avoidance strategy is appropriate in your model. Mm -hmm. Okay, avoidance strategy. Yeah, we haven't we haven't discussed it in our paper or you know, yeah. I mean I get yeah. All right, so one one at a time. Um the burden on firms to to understand um the issue of the structural injustice. I think you're totally right. I think the problem is that businesses, as as we all know, you know, be I mean those of my colleagues that are in business schools or even in law schools or um, that uh, uh, those from the audience that work in companies. I mean, companies think in economic terms and money terms. And I think that kind of really puts sometimes a blind um, eye or a particular frame on, on issues. So um, then I think you simply do not understand that if you put your supplier contract into place and put certain clauses in it. I think you as a company don't understand the ripple effects of that because you think in the business terms, you think I want to have this product at that time at that price because uh, that's what dominates, you know, your mindset, this is what you evaluated on. So I think that's the first barrier. And I think one of the biggest challenge is for companies, even this first step to understand how their day-to-day -day decisions kind of how they translate into those structural injustices. Um, so in that sense, Ellen, and I don't know who, who, who had said it, I think that I'm on, on you, this is the biggest challenge to kind of understand, get an idea of how your day-to-day -day position, your day-to-day -day decisions, your contracts as you're writing, how that creates this, um, those injustices and feed into them. Um, and that's why I, I really, that's why I really like Young's model to really start thinking about those really innocent innocent decisions that, that companies are making, or even we as consumers, right? When I now go to the supermarket to buy the fair trade chocolate or different chocolate, or I think this is what I like about, about her model that it really starts making you think. Um, so maybe giving companies a Iris Marion Young uh, seminar, I don't know, that might be one way. I just, because that's also what I like about her model because it's not about blame. It's really not about blame. It's about just rethinking the way 
you are, you know, how your individual decisions kind of contribute to something bigger. But um, biggest big challenge. Then um, Matt's question, I quickly have to look at my notes here again. Um, Matt always has good questions. I, I presented the paper two, three years ago um, before we, we got it accepted. Um, and he also had always good questions, but you're pushing me, I think, on what would Young do or, you know, how does that fit in? Um, the avoidance strategy, I think it's related to, to Rita's first comment also when you go with the vertical integration, because again, it's, it's Young's ideas, whatever you are doing, you know, you have to think about the structural consequences of this. So if you vertically integrate, your hands might be, you know, clean, but the problem persists and you as a global citizen have the responsibility still for that issue, even if it's not in your own front yard, but it's still there. And um, similar with the avoidance strategy, I think um, Yang would not approve of the avoidance strategy. Um, we um, wouldn't, wouldn't either. Um, but it could be a short term, it could be just a short term way of getting to something bigger, similar to the vertical integration that you maybe first try to get a handle of your own business and then think about how maybe this can translate to, you know, how Tony Chacoloni's maybe approach, how can this not translate to Nestle, right? So, because apparently something is not quite right there because Tony Chacoloni seems to be able to do it and they, they are doing it but Nestle is not doing it. So um, maybe this avoidance strategy, while I'm not saying this is what you should do, it might be just a first step to get a, a handle on it, especially with the vertical integration as well, and then try to think about how this could be replicated. Thank you. Well, we're quickly approaching the end of the hour, so we won't have time for a lot more questions. Um, I guess I'll just pick a couple of ones that are very direct and that hopefully you will be able to answer quickly. Um, so we have a question here from Matthew Emanuel. Um, and Matt asks, um, well, he says, we see approaches to deal with structural issues in freedom of association and supply chains. So for example, the ACT program, the global framework agreements, and Matt's question is, do you see this in forced labor? Um, and the other very practical question is actually in the chat. Uh, it's by Lisa Francis Jennings. And Lisa says, I've heard that it is impossible to buy any type of fish that has not been touched by slave labor. Is that true? And I guess I would just add on top of that, very quickly, what would be your advice for consumers who are worried about human trafficking? Mm. Yeah, with a fish, I fear it's probably right. Um, what advice would I give to consumers? I mean, I'm a, I'm a consumer too, and I'm I'm overwhelmed by all the certificates. I think all you can do is try to you know do your homework and look at the different labels or at the certifications that we have out there, um, you know, and. What really makes my heart warm is, you know, my four, my now six-year-old daughter has this in school. I mean, they start with five years, they have a sustainability week and they talk about the stuff. And um, she now knows about palm oil and she didn't learn it from me. I was, I wanted to get my presentation out when she started talking about it. Um, no, so what advice would I give to consumers is, is ask questions. And um, I think there are some, some good apps and I'm now blanking on, um, on, on the name of the one app, always when you kind of think about it, it's um, code, as a coach, I try to remember what the name is. There are a couple of apps out there. If you Google, you will find maybe some that might, might help you. Um, yeah, and then what was Matt's question? That was a tricky, that was, if that ex something exists for forced labor. Yeah, so and I, a bit like ACT or the Global Framework Agreements. My first answer would be no. But I'm also not, you know, I might just simply not know about it. Yeah, thank you. Right, so <clears throat> we're almost out of time. So unfortunately, we won't be able to ask uh, the remaining questions in the Q&A, but uh, rest assured that Judith will receive all of your questions and comments. Um, so Judith, thank you so much again for uh, giving this talk today. It has been absolutely wonderful. Um, thank you all for coming, for joining us, and I'd just like to, uh, to advertise our next seminar very quickly. Uh, the next one will be in a couple of weeks, but it will be on a Friday, uh, so on the 20th of November at the exact same time, uh, Jeffrey Moriarty, Professor of Philosophy at Bentley University, will be talking about uh, personalizing prices in e-commerce, the ethics of a kind of new pricing practice. 
So please do join us, register for the event, and I look forward to seeing you all in a couple of weeks again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.